Um, well, thank you so much, um, Helen, um, again, and for everybody what, um, what to kick off, I think that this conversation, I just wanted to share some of the insight, the substance, uh, the findings that we um, got from uh, looking at the SDGs through the Hispanic lens. And uh, I wish I would have known um, uh, Professor Helen Bond before and the, the report that you were doing about Never More Urgent, but I actually think that having those pieces of data connected uh, will make it even stronger for the future. So again, just like the methodology that we use was revised the 17 SDGs and the 169 indicators and started looking at data um, at the world level, uh, US and the US Hispanics, um, looking at how um, were Hispanics performing above national average, below national average, and then try to see trends. Um, so pretty much, um, pretty much what, you know, like the overview, if you want, of the 17 goals, uh, you can see the gray is the data that we couldn't find anything about it. The white is a data that doesn't apply uh, for the nature of the uh, Hispanic community in a number of ways. And then green is where we are above average. Uh, yellow is when we are on average nationally. And then red is where you have, um, uh, red is where you have the red flags. And as you can see, just from this heat map, uh, there's a lot of concentration on a couple of the goals uh, for th that actually coincide with the priorities and the structural barriers that have been represented in research for the last decade. So pretty much, um, even though there's not enough data, this represents um, a very clear reflection on how for the Latino community, a huge concentration is on education. Um, education goal number four, combined with malnutrition, particularly under uh, uh, malnour malnourishment of children and obesity, one in every four Latinos come to school with an empty stomach and one in every four Latinos are obese. And that connected, uh, that is pretty much connected to goal number eight, which is decent work. Uh, Latinas, particularly the most underpaid of every single group in America, uh, 54 cents of the dollar, uh, if not less in the case of nurses, for example, Latina nurses are paid 70% less than their counterparts. And so if you look at just simply this map, I think that it can give um, not only the Latino, uh, the Latino community uh, that is trying to advance these efforts, but it can really represent for uh, the Biden administration a clear map of if you wanna help Latinos, these are areas and also the interconnectedness. So just like clear, um, we're very uh, top uh, bottom uh, top line insights, some buckets of in, uh, improvement, but inequalities perceived. Perceived um, in the US, uh, the US is performing above the world and yet minorities within the US are left behind and unable to catch up. Um, COVID impacted the advancement of the SDGs and we lost the Latino community, a lot of the gains that we had put on the SDGs. So we made just like a quick, uh, essay, uh, we, we, we just like did a quick research on previous years and we were better off. So SDGs uh, really were affected by COVID also in the Latino community. Uh, the Hispanics uh, on average have much better opportunities that, uh, that, that Latinos in Latin America. Uh, we're above our, our national average in nine SDGs and below average in 36. And those 36 targets are concentrated in eight uh, goals. So just very quickly, um, no poverty, 16% of Hispanics live in poverty, 47% um, have a home ownership rate compared to 70% of the rest and 28% of the poor population um, are Hispanics. When it comes to number two, zero hunger, twice as many Hispanic children are, um, are likely to have in, insufficient food as nutritious, 50% higher rate of food insecurity for Hispanics, um, and one in three households with children headed by single women. Uh, when it comes to, uh, and I'm just gonna go through the first uh, six, the basic ones, uh, good health. And this is really, I would say the red flag for me this year, uh, particularly because vaccinations uh, from this study to now, vaccinations dropped in the Latino community 50% overall. Um, for the fear of COVID, people just withdrew from vaccinations across. So there's a, there's a risk of breakouts in different areas like measles and so on. But 20% of Hispanics do not have health insurance 
um, 9% rate more of tuberculosis uh, for Latinos. The vaccinations, only 33% uh, of Hispanics receive help. Um, and there's a, there's a higher death rate from diabetics versus non-Hispanics. On education, really, I think that this is the priority for the community. Uh, 50 more than 50% of Hispanics enroll in elementary school. Um, uh, that is compared to the white counterparts, one in three, um, have preschool, 25 degrees with a bachelor's degree, and we're still falling behind in competition of college. Uh, when, when it comes to gender equality, as I said, this is probably uh, one of the things that uh, we want to campaign this year in my organization. The minority within minority, Latinas, are the worst of all. Only 3% of Latinas in senior level positions, less paid on anything, uh, 53 percent of the dollar, 7.2 hours on average on unpaid care household, and uh, COVID just came to aggravate this uh, situation. And the last thing I want to share with you is number eight. Um, we are the working the uh, the workforce growth for America in a number of ways, particularly because we're so young. But um, the GDP was growing four times faster of the Latino GDP than the rest. Um, we're growing in also our income despite being paid less. And that is because we're not having decent work. We work two or three journeys, two or three times more than the rest. So um, different, different uh, um, work, uh, work slots throughout the day so that we can catch up. Um, so the interconnection I think that we have is very clear and there's so much more that we can do in understanding what are the correlations that can really be um, interventions that can amplify and be barriers breakers for the Latino community. And I think that those are the enablers that we're looking for aligning the Latino community in areas that are interconnected. And one of them, I'm mean, like, I just don't want to go through a lot of a lot of this, but um, one of them would be finding the domino effects uh, and education all across is the number one uh, thing that has uh, particularly first years of education could really have a knockdown effect on the different uh, in the different goals that we have. So the problems are interconnected and the more that we understand it, the better we can solve it. And so that's what I wanted to share with you of how far we were able to go and how far we want to go uh, if we work together and getting not only more data, but more people uh, to understand the, the nature of the SDGs as a framework of action. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I have a PowerPoint. Uh, should I share it from my deck or um, from my screen, Elena or Carolyn? Yes, okay. Give me just a minute here, make sure I... Oops, that's not the one I don't think. Just a second, just trying to make sure I have the Is right. Is it the one that here. we used in the presentation earlier, Helen? If that's the uh, case, I could share it for you. Uh, no, there actually I had. Uh, oh, here they are. The breakout. It's called breakout session slides. So let me see. I just found. <laughs> Just a second, I had a couple. Okay, let's see. Um, I think I found them. Are they sharing now or? Yes, I can see them. 
Okay, great. Because I'm not looking at the screen, but I, I so you're, you're seeing the title breakout session? Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. I had so many iterations of those slides. Let me give you a quick overview. I want to thank uh, Claudia uh, for sharing her presentation there. Uh, the purpose of this, some of these slides we've already seen. I promise you we will not go back over them. Uh, but what I wanted to do was just to give a very brief coming together of these two veins of research. And then for the rest of the time, um, I would I, I'd like for those that are interested here to help us frame some of the guiding questions and thrust for our working group that we're trying to form on equity and justice. And we thought it would be a great time to get your ideas. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of, before we do that and, and just can talk generally, I wanted to give a just a very brief framing that I had started in the other presentation, the equity and working group. And we have interested people. I've already got, I've received several emails from people that aren't able to join us here that would like to connect uh, with us later about this. Uh, wanting to know more about it. It's the Leave No One Behind, which is a central com uh, commitment of the SDGs. And that is what's going to frame our equity and working group at SDSN. Uh, I'm going to scroll down here. Just very, very briefly, this is an old mock-up of something we had that we, um, that we used parts of in our report. But it really pulls together, I think, the thrust of what Claudia shared. I was listening very intently to her description. Uh, many of the same issues with the Hispanics, a community you have it with the Black community, uh, sometimes times one or two. Uh, but this really gives a focus of how we pulled the never more urgent report together. Uh, and the five key areas of disparities that I heard in Claudia's report on the Latino community in terms of the food and housing, the healthcare disparities, which I didn't get to really touch on, but uh, we can do that at another venue, um, the justice, uh, the COVID-19 disparities uh, that we, in our next iteration on the working group and on this report, we'd like to look at the vaccine disparities which are really mimicking everything else we've seen with the COVID-19 disparities across all three groups, uh, African-Americans, Hispanics, and the indigenous community, Native Americans uh, sometimes suffering the worst of plight. Um, so, you know, and I don't wanna go over, you know, all the uh, things here. I have a couple other slides, but this really pulls together how we envisioned uh, the Never More Urgent Report and our work moving forth on the uh, working group. Now, what I see, and I'm going to ask you, what are your ideas that you think should really frame our group? But I do want to say that one important thing that we did find uh, in our report, and I'm interested to see if Claudia has found something similar, we found really a lack of data, a lack of disaggregating of data to be able to really find where the disparities are. And it really can give us what I consider an incomplete skewed picture. For example, um, in the American Community Survey 2006 reported a relatively low rate, 14% of Asians uh, achieving less than a high school level education. And as uh, Claudia iterated, education is a priority SDG uh, for, and for African Americans. But when you disaggregate that, uh, we found that other Asian communities, the rate of achieving less than a high school level education was actually double, nearly double. Uh, and so this is just an understanding to really understand what's happening here. We have to have more and better data. And I can't tell you what a consistent theme that was. Um, just for an example, give me about three more minutes and we're gonna just talk. Uh, types of racial data gaps found, you know, and Elena was really, Elena Lynch, I thank her for her leadership and cooperation in this project as well as Carolyn. They really uh, help us, you know, identify where those gaps were. Uh, 
data not made public, not released, predicted schedule, Bureau of Justice, maternal mortality, you would think something as critical as that would be collected in a consistent way across states. We found out it was not. Um, no collection mandate uh, in terms of lead and water. You would think with what happened in Flint, there would be a movement toward that. And reason I'm really highlighting that there's a Harvard study uh, in which they uh, really decry that the lack of the collection of good data, disaggregated data, so that you could really see what's happening is really a human rights violation in and, in and of itself. And it, and it uh, you know, uh, just persist along with the systemic uh, uh, racism and discrimination. So more examples of data not found. Um, I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit more here. Uh, I shared a bit of this uh, in the, the previous slide. I think when we do, and I hope everyone here will join our working group, this is something that we will look at. Uh, it's being published by the Kaiser Foundation. Unbelievable disparities here uh, beginning to show itself uh, when data comes. So. Uh, that was just a continuation of what I had said before, sharing results, findings, future directions for the working group. Now we would like your input uh, for the working group. I've laid out a few, uh, let me just say one thing, this will be a new working group within SDSN. It's been in my head for three, four, five months. I've shared some ideas, bounced some things off, but I thought what a great opportunity to share some things with you. Now, we would I'd just like to open it up and uh, you've heard from Claudia and I, what are the key questions or topics that you think uh, should frame the focus of our working group on equity and justice? You know, what are your ideas on this? We have ideas, but we could really would appreciate, you know, your um, suggestions. So I'm just going to open it up and we can just relax and talk freely, hopefully. Any ideas? What major directions? I mean, I have some things listed on the next slide, uh, but I didn't, you know, and I can go straight to them if, if you want to look at what I have and then we can use that as, as jumping off points, you think? Okay, let's do that. Here's some things that I put together that I've been thinking about. Uh, and so let's just take them one by one. And, you know, maybe you can share us, you know, what you think. We were thinking that, at least I was thinking, uh, I've been listening very closely to this week, to yesterday's conversation. I mentioned it before in our, our overview uh, with Elena and at the leadership council and generally even at our leadership council. There's one thing I've been consistently hearing is that the SDGs, first of all, and I heard this from, from Jeff and I really appreciated his really well-rounded overview that the SDGs really haven't found ground or substance here in the US, you know, and I realized that. Um, but I've heard also from minority communities and those that, that advocate for their interests that SDGs really aren't relevant or have not been relevant, sometimes not even known uh, or recognized in communities of color. That is a major, I can tell you that's a major issue. And Claudia, do you find the same in your communities that you advocate for? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I was introducing Manuel who, um, who helped actually lead this project, but I, I, I really, uh, we did a, just like a pilot and less than 1% of um, what less than 1% of the leaders of the community have a sense of what the SDGs are. And almost everybody feels that they are not relevant to the work they do. Yeah, that, and that's, that's a real issue. And that's been in my head as one of the key things that I think could frame the work of our working group, because if you can't show the relevance of SDGs to communities of color, uh, you know, 
So uh, I, I need some of your ideas on how can we do this? There's a role for universities. I, I see all the wonderful work that we're doing in SDSN and beyond. I think everyone has a role, uh, but do you have some ideas on how we could really go about doing that? Hi everybody, this is Lucia. Um, it's it's more. I, I'm not an expert in terms of 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 the topic of this group. I mean, I'm an expert in the sense that I've experienced it myself. I know what we're talking about here, so in that way. But I don't have any really like well thought out responses. But one thing that does come out um, is I ask myself, okay. Number one, relevance. How can universities do to help? I understand we all sort of represent academic institutions or think tanks, but what about how, you know, one thing that I always think about is how, what are we doing to reach the community groups, those little small community groups that are working on different issues, whether it be, you know, healthcare or child or, you know, or, or poverty. It, should they be part of this group or should this just be, you know, left at the university level um, for us to create data and reports and then share with everybody? I, that's just a question that it keeps going in my mind because if we want to really make it relevant, mm -hmm. somehow I think we need to be working with those, you know, on the ground groups in one way or the other, instead of just giving them reports, because one, they probably won't read them. Um, but I, so that's all, I'm just throwing it out there. Lucia, that's, that's, that's a great comment. I mean, basically what I hear you saying, if, if we want to make this relevant to the communities, shouldn't we make the working group relevant to the communities and invite them to be a part? I think that's a fantastic idea. I hadn't thought yes. of it. So, oh, okay. Yes, I mean, it's, it's not that easy. It's going to take a lot more work. But if we really want the news spread and we want to really, we want this group to reflect the realities on the ground, we need to be, they need to be involved with us. We need to be working hand in glove with them on this, I think. You know, I, 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 I absolutely, because I think we're so, sometimes we're so steeped in this ivory tower university. And sometimes universities don't seem relevant to the communities that they intend to serve. Uh, so inviting the members that we want to, to reach out to and to make them relevant, inviting them to the, to the working group. That is, uh, that's a fantastic idea. And if you don't mind, I'll, that'll be part of what we report back. Um, can I add one, one thing, um, Helen, to what Lucia just said? Yes, yes. I, I think you're absolutely right. But also, I think that it has to be relevant uh, concretely. I mean, like, just like saying this is a great, you know, these are the Ten Commandments and, uh, you know, like you can go and it's a carrot and the stick and we all know those. But at the end of the day, I mean, I tell you, for Latinos, what matter is to be able to have their, their kids go to school, to have enough, you know, like internet now that there's COVID. Um, they dream of having a home and maybe even one day, forget about the green revolution, is like having that Tesla, like, like something like that, <laughs> that could combine, um, you know, like climate change, a green, you know, like green agenda, but also infrastructure building uh, for small businesses. If there would be a way in which universities can help create the correlation of how, you know, like how to make it tangible for people, because I think that a lot of times, even as much as much communication you want to put on marketing, on creating great videos, if it's only only a framework, is very removed to the local priorities. So I think that for me, one of the areas in which I think for us, mm -hmm. the Latino community. Uh, we can try to engage them in educating them and, and, and having champions on the SDGs is through electric cars. It's, it's saying mm -hmm. because of the SDGs, because of the cli climate accord, we can go to the Biden administration, ask for more incentives, tax credit for mm -hmm. third and fourth user of electric cars so that you can, instead of being paying so much on, on reparations, maintenance and so on, so that you can also be like Elon Musk, you can also you help the planet, but help yourself by saving money. I mean, like that would, those are the type of things where I think that universities can play 
an incredible role in, in firing up your students and your faculty to start looking at ways in which you, this can be more concrete. Thank you, uh, Claudia. You made a very, very important comment there. I understand that you're saying not only do we need to make them relevant, that they need to be made concretely. In other words, you know, people need to be able to see that the SDGs really can improve their lives in some measurable way. And right now, we don't have that connection between the SDGs and really the communities that uh, they are meant to protect, of course, all communities in that. Um, my next question would be, um, how do we bring about this relevance that Lucia talked about and this concrete relevance that Claudia has reminded us of? How do we bring those two together? What projects? And, and, I, and I'm, I, I definitely agree. I mean, as academics, which all of us are, uh, we like to make reports and I think reports and measurement is important. But how do we go, besides inviting them onto the working group, what kind of shared work that's gonna be concrete and both relevant? Well, hi everybody, Manuel here. Uh, I, I work with, with Claudia in, in this project. Uh, of course, one part is about uh, working at the structural level, which you uh, in the, and the scholars do you your valuable input for policy, of course. But on the end, uh, uh, we at We Are Human, with the leadership of Claudia, are uh, talking with the private sector. So that the mm -hmm. private sector are looking for uh, initiatives on how can they play a role in in injustice in 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 this environment that consumers their consumers are looking to. Uh, for, for them to get answers uh, where they are not finding those answers in, 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 in the regular institutions. So we'll probably present this framework in, in a very simple way to match their eagerness to act in a way with uh, where those actions could have the higher return on, on, on investment in terms of social impact. So the, well, the role of the private sector, I think it was only interesting to ignite change. Okay, thank you. I, I, we lost, I lost, at least I lost a little bit of what you said, but I think I, I think I uh, got it uh, to connect working with the private sector um, and making some gains toward concreteness and relevancy by bringing in the private se sector, explaining things in a simple but achievable way. I, 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 I absolutely agree. Um, Helen, I don't know if, you know, I'm sure that Howard is doing the same thing, but I know at Columbia University where um, I, I worked for many years, they always had, they have a, a center and a community outreach. They're always trying to reach out to the community um, because even though, you know, it's, it's uh, Columbia and it's really in the middle of Harlem, we, you know, it doesn't really connect much with what Harlem, what's going on in the Harlem community. So what I'm thinking is, you know, shouldn't we be meeting with that center at whatever university we're sitting that's trying to reach out to these communities and already they have all kinds of things that they're doing with these communities, bring them on board in terms of just, you know, even if we just have a focus group, what are the needs, immediate needs of these communities? And then using the, the skills of that Claudia brings like marketing, you know, how do we turn this whole issue on asthma and their concern, you know, many, I mean, in Harlem, it's a big thing about asthma and the kids and how do we turn that and connect it to the SDG? So instead of trying to, you know, they're already working on lots of issues and our role can be helping them see how whatever issue it is that they're working on connects with these global goals and, you know, that, that are, are not even global, that they're local goals, that the, yes, these global goals exist, but we also have these local goals and, and that they're really relevant to the issues that they're dealing with immediately. I, so 
in a way, the university, like you said, would continue to be to lead this. But I think that one simple thing is, you know, meeting with these groups, what, you know, whatever groups that, you know, they are around our universities, what are the issues, documenting, and we have all kinds of literature on that, but the meeting would help to sort of, you know, add a human component to what the literature is saying, um, mm -hmm. and then work on, okay, how do we translate these very local needs into these SDGs? And, and then that's where we can come in, helping them see how this is, you know, it, it's, it's, well, it's just some thoughts. I'm thinking out loud here, so I'm scattered, but I, I no, think- No, you're all, all of your thoughts is perfect because I heard something in that that is really critical from all of you, but from what Lucia just said, you know, and I realized this is, this is the way I had been thinking about it. I had been thinking about it. You take the SDGs, because I've, I've got it on my PowerPoint, so I can't deny it. I was thinking about taking the SDGs and connecting them to issues. But what Lucia just said, is why don't we start with an issue like asthma? And Claudia has mentioned issues, Manuel has mentioned issues. Why don't we take an issue like asthma, connect it to the community, whatever their issues are, and then connect that to an SDG by first going to where kind of where the people are with their specific issues. I mean, that I, I, I just, I, I really think that's, I, I really think that's the way we should really go in terms of relevance. I think all what every all of you have mentioned, uh, Claudia, about it being concrete, Manuel involving private industry, uh, Lucia involving the community, and instead of like I was thinking SDGs to the issues, start with the issue to the SDGs. So I, I, those are some of the things I'm going to report back. You know, that like was really about this, just uh, just saying, uh, like you know, I I I'm obviously too close for to this. I um, I used to work at the executive office of the Secretary General precisely to try to market and communicate the SDGs, and we used to um, say that the ring of the SDGs or the round or whatever you want to call it, the brand, um, should equal what the Olympic rings are. Like the rings of the Olympics are the best of hum of the best of sports. The SDG ring should be the best of humanity. But thinking about what Lucia said is true. Like people don't really like the Olympics as such. They like either tracking or swimming or, you know, like you you like a, a volleyball or whatever it is. And then you look at the best of that uh, in the Olympics. So probably it is not a bad idea uh, to see whether, you know, like per university, one can take one issue that is the most important at the local level and then just make sure that the narrative is that uh, those, those efforts actually go and meet in a bigger framework where there's best practices and, and, and lessons learned and, you know, like and, and tracking mechanisms to support. Yeah. I love the uh, Olympic analogy there, Claudia. That was, that yes. was really good. Thank you. Yeah. I, I do have a comment as well, if you might. Yes, please. A current celebrity from the SJ Academy. Yes, as Latino myself, um, and my background coming from Argentina, um, where I was born and raised, um, is in the legal side. So I come a bit from the human rights perspective. And um, I find often this, this uh, issue of, um, you know, I, I really think always on long term and, and education as well. And I feel it's so critical. Uh, and then that's why I loved uh, Claudia, your presentation yesterday, which says, all, we are all human, right? And from the education perspective, I thought um, how important it is to continue to emphasize the fact that yes, we're all human beings, we all deserve the same rights and we need to seek that, but we also need to celebrate and acknowledge the diversity and what each of us bring and each of our communities and, and really put that more, more front and center. Because if we were um, going to celebrate more with not just you know, the beauty of our communities and, and things that sometimes, unfortunately, we have to say some other cultures don't have that and that support and that caring for each other, but also the great work uh, in terms of you know, um, science or um, art, anything that, that we, I mean, and anything and everything that we put on the table, right? Mm -hmm. So I think education is key um, across communities and around, you know, like, uh, just to, also for the elimination of bias, that's so important in the long term. So I, I totally, I think that 
we need to uh, be able to deliver and find solutions, concrete solutions on health issues, on education, and so on. But in the long term, I really would like that we all feel uh, that, you know, exactly that we're all human beings and we all have so much beauty to bring and that that can be more recognized and both front and center. And also that when we use, whether are the SHGs or any other tool, which I'm totally, of course, working on the SHGs and totally bought that on the importance of it. But I remember in the past, I work, I work with the International Center for Transitional Justice um, and issues of post-conflict societies and how you address the wrongs of the past, and, you know, and when it comes to indigenous people particularly, oftentimes uh, we need to learn so much from them, right? When it comes to the connection with the earth and, and the land and the nature and the ancestors and, and so on. Um, oftentimes some tools like, for instance, through commissions have been used sometimes in a way that they were, they were seen as like, oh, this is more Western tools to try to figure out something that you know, this doesn't really fit with us because they don't like reports. They would like maybe ceremonies and, and rituals and, and bringing everyone together and finding that connection, right? So how can we find things that they, that, that all of us can find relevant? And um, also the SHGs is something that they feel they own, that is part of, you know, a reflection in a way of who they are as well. And it's not something that came out, you know, that other people decide. And um, so just kind of feeling, it's, I think it's, there's a bit of analogy with this of, of the um, uh, Olympics, right? Um, what is that really make us feel that this is uh, something that reflects in a way who we are and, and where we wanna go and, and make it kind of appropriate it, right? Absolutely. Florencia, I didn't see you there till you spoke. You're on my screen the way it's set up. So I'm glad that, that, you, that you spoke up because you raised something very, very critical. I mean, I'm couching this in the leave no one behind, which is the critical part of the SDGs. But if you move further beyond that, what you really have, it's, it's you're right. We are all human, human rights. This notion of respect for diversity. You know, maybe people aren't feeling that in the SDGs, you know, even though it's there. Uh, but that 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 is really critical to to move this this work forward. And so thank you for uh, reminding us of that. I, I do appreciate that. Um, this has been such wonderful feedback. Uh, I think we've covered the accessibility, which is something that I've been on my mind. You know, I, accessibility and re relevance, uh, uh, relevance rather, uh, the lens. Uh, I like the way Claudia used uh, when she would mention these. Uh, it's how uh, the SDGs are seen through the uh, Hispanic community's lens. And so I'm asking how can the SDGs and the uh, leave no one behind agenda be used as a prism to better understand and address intersecting forms of racism and discrimination. And I think this is from a discussion that Elena and I had. We've been working on something to extend this and we had talked about it as a lens. But I'd like to go to four and five if you don't mind. Uh, and I think Florencia uh, comments because I have to watch our time, which I've been really bad on today. Um, uh, how can the SDGs be used to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and better data? And I think one thing that, that uh, we've all been mentioning uh, is to, you know, tying this to a diversity equity lens. But um, so I, I think we've talked a bit about that as well. And with the short time we have left, maybe looking at, at policy, because ultimately to make this concrete and people, people need to feel some change in their lives, how can we connect it to policy? Um, All right, I went, I went to just like, I, I, I said it again, I said it yesterday, but I will say it until you know, like, I really hope that we could come uh, together to create some uh, standardized ways to uh, measure and guide particularly corporate America on what it means to be diverse and inclusive. I mean, everybody's trying to be that because the public eye is there, there's action, but there's no goal, there's no standard, there's no goals, there's no indicators, there's nothing that we have on the SDGs. The beauty of the SDGs is you have that. And, you know, like for uh, for whatever is worth, I think that there's so much cross paddling that had to be done for uh, corporations to say like, how do I measure that I'm sustainable or that I'm SDG enough? And you know, like there's um, there's uh, there's 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 very 
there's very uh, uh, there's very CEOs. I would say they have a headache in trying to feed the Larry Fink criteria and this one and so on. For for me, the best thing that could really happen to make sure that uh, there's no lip service or also there's no headache on course correcting is to try to put together some sort of like the SDGs for diversity and inclusion because there's no SDG on diversity and inclusion. And I think that that's a part in which I see uh, there's there's I see that there's an area of uh, growth collaboration, but also um, it's it's concrete enough that you can you can take it and, and have it. Claudia, are you suggesting an SDG 18? Because that immediately that's what came to my mind. It's either an SDG 18 <laughs> or just simply like the ISDGs or something like that. You know, like I, I don't think it's possible to add one more. Um, or it would be a, a little bit complicated, but what I what I think is that if there's a, if there's a, a segment like the Paris, the, you know, like climate climate agreement or something where you can say like this is what it means, and if you're a company, it's parity to population or whatever, particularly for minorities, mm -hmm. like particularly important for minorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had, I think Lucia is, is on mic, so I'm, I'm assuming you have, you, you're unmuted, so that, sorry. Okay, that. yes, no, no. I was just, just using. <laughs> yes, I was just gonna throw in, um, Helen, you're an educator and for other educators, you probably, you, you're familiar, I'm sure, with culturally, culturally relevant pedagogy. And so how can we bring maybe that framework because we use that framework in the classroom, right? When we're working with, you know, um, diverse populations. So using a similar, that sort of framework to working with populations um, that we're trying to really educate or help understand the SDGs and the role of the SDGs in their lives. That's uh, one point. And then based on what Claudia just said about having perhaps a separate um, SDG, I was thinking, well, should it really be separate? Or should we really push for really thinking of DEI as something that's embedded, integrated throughout all 17 SDGs? Mm -hmm. just, just a thought, that's it. Maybe to pick on that, I don't know if we still have time, uh, but I agree with Lucia on, on it has to be cross, uh, uh, across the, the board, but also uh, SDG um, target 4.7, I think it really called us, right, also to uh, respect the diversity and, and have much more peaceful and I think happy interactions in a way. And um, so I think there, like the, the portion of education for sustainable development uh, could be also another way to, to um, bring it. Yeah, uh, I was, as I was, because I'm trying to really take your notes because your ideas are, are, are so wonderful. You know, I was again thinking about, I'm, again, everyone knows I'm this huge proponent of, of the work that UNESCO does, uh, but all the UN institutions who do great work. But they actually have a document in which they argue for connecting the SDGs when it comes to policy formation and creation to connecting the SDGs to a culture uh, for, for public policy. And so uh, I think that could, and I, I, that's what I hear you're saying, uh, both of you in terms of that. Uh, I like using the culturally relevant framework as a framework for that, that Lucia said. And Claudia, was that 4.7 that you mentioned, SDG 4.7, indicator 4.7? Actually it was me, Florencia, yes, but it started- Oh, Florencia, with, um, okay, I'm so yeah. sorry, so sorry. Okay, that was 4.7, I wanted to make note of that. Okay, I think we are, it's right at 3.30. So I think we need to, to transfer back over to the larger group. 